That's when Simon decided one of his other groups needed a kind of Pete Townsend, so he picked me. They resented that incredibly because they wrote songs which weren't very good, unfortunately. Most people who write bad songs tend to think of themselves as geniuses. I think we changed Mark quite a lot in John's Children and brought him out of himself completely. We really were totally over the top as a stage act. So Mark had to join in. He became quite wild with us and lost all his inhibitions, especially on stage. The Technicolor Dream was the last thing that we ever did with Mark. The atmosphere was incredibly heady. Everybody was out of their brains on all kinds of stuff. Desdemona was Mark's interpretation of one of Elvis Presley's early songs, Jailhouse Rock. He was really into that sort of thing. Unfortunately, one of the lines in it was, lift up your skirt and fly. Lift up your skirt and fly. And in Mark's fantasy mind, this literally was a witch on her broomstick going off towards the stars and the moon. But in the BBC's mind of the day, that was something to do with sex. So it got banned. And that was really what killed John's children. Lift up your skirt and speak. When Mark came back from the John's Children tour, his first thought was, I don't need John's Children, I'm going to do what they do without them. And that that night, Ravi Shankar was playing. I do remember that Mark sat forward the whole time, just, you know, really staring at this thing. He was obviously taking the whole experience in. I have no idea how this might have worked on his mind, but he did become that person that was sitting cross-legged with a bongo player. Tyrannosaurus Rex, um, Mark Boland is the, well there are only two in the group, but Mark Boland is the singer. John Peel was very, very important in the, the growth of Mark's public persona in terms of, you know, the airplay he gave him. And not only that, but if John had a gig, he would insist that these Tyrannosaurus Rex freaks would come along as well. Uh, and he spread the message. Mark decided to go out and uh, form his own little group, just the two of them, and he sings very gentle, soft little songs, and uh, one of them's playing right now in the background, and it's very beautiful. The songs I'm writing now are exactly the songs I wrote when I lived with my parents. It was when I was eight. I read about prehistoric monsters and I dug that whole scene. Then again in a Ray Bradbury story. And that's where I got the name Tyrannosaurus Rex. And when Tony Visconti came down to Middle Earth, he got excited. I wanted to maybe find another pop group and find the new Beatles, like I think every young producer wanted to do in those days. But instead, I found something that was far more innovative and enchanting and very, very interesting. There was Mark and Steve Peregrine to playing the songs that would become the first Tyrannosaurus Rex album. They, they hadn't been recorded yet. And I just thought I was transported to some magical place. Summer 67 was such a hippie time. 
and there was that Jennifer Juniper atmosphere in the air. So Mark seemed exactly right for the moment and the rhythm of the acoustic guitar. And then when you add the very sort of poetic lyrics, that you've got a package there that was really very appealing. <laughs> We did release Deborah as a single, and that was the biggest buzz of all. Our first single. That record got to about 30 in the charts, which threw everybody. That commuted my sentence of working in a factory for the rest of my life. He was unique. There was absolutely no one sounding like or bending words like Mark was doing at the time. And Mark said, if we're going to continue to work together and you want to understand where I'm at, you're going to have to read The Lord of the Rings. He borrowed heavily from the Tolkien style, maybe, and the concept of a mythological civilization before recorded history, but he made up his own characters. And somehow he would weave them into love songs that a troubadour might have sung in uh, Elizabethan times. You know, they had these beautiful British chord changes. He had all this intuition about how to do this properly with virtually no training at all. His inspiration came from somewhere very deep in, inside him. And, and, and Tolkien fed that. I relive my childhood through my songs because I get inside things like books and records and live them. Textures of the past interest me. They were difficult songs to interpret. I'm not going to pretend that I uh, understand them fully. A lot of it was stream of consciousness. It didn't matter that it was crackers. It, the, you know, with a lot of poetry, it's does it sound good? <laughs> from another place. You couldn't pigeonhole what he was doing in, in Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's that old cliche of when they made Mark, they broke the mold. It's, you, you, no one ever knew anyone at the time that was anything like him. There were those two or three years in the middle where I suppose I was a poet with a capital P, which turned a lot of people off, but it also turned a lot of people on. As a band, Steve Peregrine took and I hadn't really got on. He was into a drug-orientated and socio-political revolution of which I did not feel a part. My life is music. I think we're in a bit of a hippie bubble, so things like revolution on the streets, issues of the Vietnam War, were not impacting at all into Mark's lyrics. I don't want to know about society as it is. It brings me down. I can't associate with it at all. And I can't be involved with politicians. I wish I could get away to another place where mountains rise unspoilt to the sky and you could ride horses as far as the eye could see. Mark was not really interested in, in the political climate or what was going on around him other than when it affected his bookings and festivals and so on. But I don't think it's fair to say that he was a cynic. Um, as I think John Peel called him a... a flower child with a knife up his sleeve. 
Mark was very sincere in what he was doing. It's like a worship for me to write, because I don't do it. You know, it's like I'm being used by melody as a being, if you want. And there are certain chords that just, there, there, there are magic mists within those chords. You play a, a sort of C major chord, and I hear like 25 melodies and symphonies up here. I've just got to pull one out, you know. You know, it's just anything, it's all there. There's no strain, it just gushes out. Things change, but I'm happy at the moment. Marriage is a great basis for sanity. I'd have opted out years ago without June. June was Mark's first wife, and she was enormously important in his career. Mark turned up one day in her office, blagging, as his, was his way, and uh, June was very taken with him. It was beautiful summer's day. And he opened the door, and, there's, and it was just... It was, he said, would you like some muesli? <laughs> so I said, oh, yes, please. So we sat out on the tiny little um, grass at the back of the house, not, not garden as such, but... And we just sat out there, cross-legged, eating muesli and talking. And then he said, I've got something to give you. And out of his trousers pocket, he bought a little piece of paper and I opened it. And it was the most beautiful love poem. And I looked at him and he said, he said, I'm in love with you. June was, was his muse, but also his manager and his, his soulmate. June believed 110% in, in Mark. She devoted her entire life to him and she took care of all the practicalities and dealt with people she she turned on the tears so he wouldn't have to see some of the, the nasty side of the music business and for a while he was really happy but underlying he wanted what he'd always wanted he wanted to be the world's biggest superstar and he could see he wasn't getting a superstar sitting on a rug playing an acoustic guitar so there was a part of mark which was still fuming to get out and be something else so Mark did a very clever thing. He jumped a generation and he went back to the 50s. And we found a way of modernizing it and making it sound really fresh and new. The electric guitar changed everything. That really made it a current sound that you'll get on the radio. By that time, he changed the, the group name to T-Rex and he had uh, Mickey Finn in the band. What I did was a gamble. I thought, I'm going to put it out, and if it's not a hit, there's no way I'm ever going to get a hit record. I went along to my local record shop, which was in Kings Heath, Birmingham, with my pocket money, and bought this very unimpressive piece of vinyl. And I took this home, to my little record player in my bedroom and I put it on and I just list out to this incredible song. The first time I saw them, they were playing Ride a White Swan. We knew vaguely about the Beatles or the Stones, but they seemed as far away as, as sort of Mozart and George Formby. And those turning a, a teenager suddenly had their own thing, their own world. And they could get hold of the 70s and make it their own. <laughs> 